All right, this is Tyler Baker here in Jacksonville, Florida, Pastor Tyler Baker, and uh, I have an exciting episode here for you today. Officially, we have a name for uh, the podcast, and it is Contend for the Faith Podcast. Uh, so today, what we could say is uh, this is episode three, technically, for uh, Contend for the Faith, and we have a very, very exciting guest uh, on for us today, and uh, that is going to be Dr. Kent Hoven. So uh, immediately when I had decided that I was going to be having uh, the podcast, one of the very first guests that came to mind uh, was Dr. Kent Hoven. So we are honored and very thankful that you would come on with us, Dr. Hoven. Well, thank you, sir. It's good to be here. I preached quite a few times in Jacksonville, and you got some sinners in that town. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you got a job. Oh, yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah, okay. yeah, we know, we know. <laughs> All righty. So um, most of uh, the audience is probably going to be uh, fairly familiar with who you are, Dr. Hoven, but if you don't mind, can you just give a brief introduction uh, for yourself? You can throw a plug out there. And of course, a plug for our channel as well. Uh, if you could go ahead and subscribe to our channel, make sure that you share this video, that you like this video. And then also Dr. Hoven is going to introduce himself and uh, all of his ministries and resources as well. All right. Yes, sir. Good to be with you. My name is Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. This May will be 50 years. I taught high school science and math for 15 years. I've done 331, uh, de 341 debates now uh, against atheists at universities. I believe the Bible is true, and evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. It's nothing but a Amen. religion. There's no evidence for evolution at all. Okay. Right. Anyway, I take on all comers. If anybody believes in evolution, have, give me a call, 855-BIG-DINO. Uh, right. Extension 4 to schedule a debate. Extension 3 to talk to me. Extension 1, talk to our secretary or look at our bookstore. Our website at drdino.com, D-R-D-I-N-O. We believe the Bible's true. God made the world in six days, about 6,000 years ago. Dinosaurs lived with man. We have a theme park in Pensacola, I mean, in uh, Lenox, Alabama, north of Pensacola, called Dinosaur Adventureland. It is really fun. 140 acres, all kinds of fun stuff to do. Bring your whole church, come on over, and spend a couple of days. We've got 25 cabins you can stay in, 17 lakes to fish or swim in. It's really a blast here. Amen. Yeah, we'll have to come soon. So um, I have actually uh, a, I teach at a Christian school here in Jacksonville, and I'll show your seminars from time to time. And I had introduced a couple of the kids too as well. So uh, if they tell me, uh, I, you know, I would maybe they would go and I wouldn't find out about it. But if they ever let me know, that'd be interesting. If we talk again, I'll let you know that uh, we sent some people your way and then hopefully our church comes as well. Sounds great. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, what we have scheduled with Dr. Hoven for uh, this episode is going to be uh, Dr. Hoven is going to give us a presentation on creation. And the hope is that he can come back another time and go over uh, eschatology with us. We can look at some end times Bible prophecy. That's obviously a, uh, always a very interesting topic. So we'd love to do that again. But today he's going to go over a presentation for us with creation. And then at the end, some people had sent in some questions. Uh, so we're going to do a, a short Q&A. So uh, Dr. Hoven, if you don't mind giving us that creation presentation. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, brother. Well, let me put a few slides up here so you can see I'm a visual learner. I think most people like to see, uh, see, it, see it and hear it at the same time. I've been in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola for, uh, oh, there we go, um, almost eight years now, seven and a half years. Someone gave us 140 acres, the old gravel pit in Lenox, Alabama, to build our Christian camp. We're on Rumble and Odyssey and Genesis Baptist Church on YouTube and drdino.com, uh, all bunch of channels. We just want to strengthen people's faith in the Word of God. Okay, let me get up to basic idea. I believe the Scripture, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God. The word inspire means to breathe in, like a respirator, expired, you know, perspiration. Inspire means breathe, okay? So God breathed His Word out, and 40 different men wrote it down, and we've got God's Word. Amazing. I, love, I believe it from cover to cover. Okay, we're supposed to be ready to give an answer to an, all those who ask a question about what, why, we, why we believe. Most Christians are not ready to answer the simple question, why do you believe the Bible? Why do you believe Noah's flood? Those things like that. Hopefully I give you a little ammunition today that you can use to strengthen your faith. I want to strengthen your faith in God's Word. It is absolutely true, cover to cover. Secondly, if you're not saved, I'm going to try to get you converted, okay? And if you're saved and not doing much for the Lord, I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. There's a war going on, soldier. Pick up a weapon. Do something. Carry bullets. Pay for the bullets. Take care of the wounded. If you can't shoot, you can carry the bullets. Everybody can be doing something for the Lord. Okay. The Bible warned us in the last days there would be scoffers who would come, 
who are walking after their own lust. And boy, the world's full of them, okay? They're going to say, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willingly are ignorant of. The scoffers are willingly ignorant of three things. Number one, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. God just simply spoke everything into existence. He didn't have to lift a finger. He spoke. He created the heavens. And look at this. The earth was standing out of the water and in the water. I find most Christians don't have a clue what the original creation was like. Why did they live to be 900 years old? What was the original creation like? Well, the earth was created standing out of the water and in the water. We'll cover that in just a minute. And the second thing they're ignorant of is whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The scoffers are ignorant of how the world was flooded in Noah's flood. Thirdly, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Scoffers are ignorant of the coming judgment of God, which is why I wrote the book, What on Earth is About to Happen for Heaven's Sake? We're headed for disaster on planet Earth. What's about to happen? It's going to be bad. I did a book on that, a video series, a chart behind me and all that. Now, so <clears throat> according to the Bible, man brought death into the world. Man introduced death to God's perfect world and messed it up. According to evolution, death brought man into the world. Who's, who's right? Did man bring death into the world or did death bring? See, if evolution is true, one animal evolves a little better than the rest. Well, the rest of them have to die or this new improved gene does not take over the population. Evolution is nothing but a religion of death. Okay. I think it's the dumbest idea in the world. The Bible says by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, by man came death. In Adam all died. So the question is simple, you know, who, who's right? Well, I believe God is right. So what was that original creation like? How can the earth be in the water and out of the water? Here's a little sketch of what might have been like. I believe there was water above the atmosphere, above the air, where we are breathing now. Secondly, there was most of the water that's now in the oceans was in the crust of the earth. I'll show you. So what did they eat before the flood? What's it going to be like in the 1,000-year reign of Christ when the Lord fixes it back like it used to be? Were there really giants in the earth over 10 feet tall? Oh, maybe over 15? Yeah. So the scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens and how the creation was destroyed. So they're willingly ignorant. All right, let's talk about this. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? Notice it says that by the word of God, the heavens, plural, were of old. If you have a King James Bible, which I think is where God preserved his word, all the rest of them have some serious problems. King James Bible will say in the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven, singular. Almost all the new ones say heavens, plural. That is wrong. He made heaven, one, and the earth. Later, he divides this heaven up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. But in verse 1, it should be singular, heaven. So the world was overflowed with water, and the judgment of God is coming. All right, let me get up to where I want to show you the... Uh, oh, oh. Right, no, not the gap theory. Okay, let's skip up to slide number 204. Here. God said in verse number 6, <clears throat> let there be... <clears throat> A firmament. What is that? We'll talk about that in a minute. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it, that would be the firmament, divide the waters from the waters. Some people say, well, the firmament is the dirt, because that keeps the water away from the water. Oh, no, no, it's not the dirt. Keep reading. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that life, and fowl, that's birds, that fly above the earth in the open firmament. Well, there you have it. The birds don't fly in the dirt. The birds fly in the air. So the first heaven is the air we're breathing, the atmosphere. <clears throat> God said, <clears throat> let there be a firm, let there, let, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Now, this is the second heaven where he made this sun, moon, and stars. Then we have one mention only of the third heaven in the Bible here in 2 Corinthians. Paul, I believe he was rocked to sleep or stoned to death, outside the city of Lystra, and he was caught up to the third heaven. And he saw things he can't even talk about, couldn't even describe it. Came back down and woke up, got up off the, uh, the road, and they said, Paul, where you been? I'm in heaven. What did you see? He said, there's no way to describe it to you. How would you explain colors to a blind man? 
How would you explain silence to a deaf man? How can you explain heaven to an earthling? Can't be done. But for the rest of Paul's life, he was anxious to die. He'd go to town and preach, and they'd say, we're going to kill you. Oh, yeah? Good. Let's do it. Come on. He couldn't wait to die. God, there are three heavens in the Bible. The Bible says in, in Psalm 19, the heavens, now it's plural, declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. So back to Genesis chapter 1. So God made the firmament, that would be the air we're breathing, <clears throat> and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. What? Water above the atmosphere. That's what it says. I'll explain what I think it means in a minute. We see in Psalm 148, 3,000 years later, praise him, ye heaven, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens, plural. There might still be a layer of water or ice above the heavens. Where's the last star? If we could find the last star, the obvious question is, what's after that? I think there's a layer of crystal and canopy of ice of some kind. I got a model of it here. Yeah, here we go. What if everything we see, the whole universe, as huge as it is, is in a glass ball on God's dresser? And he picks it up and shakes it once in a while. How are you guys doing in there? Okay. I think that the, God made the heavens, three of them, first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, and the earth. Now, but in Genesis 1, 1, it's heaven singular. The Bible says the scoffers would be ignorant of how the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. In Isaiah 40, he said, God sits on the circle of the earth and he stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Ah, stretched out the heavens. 17 times in the Bible, it says God stretched out the heavens. Well, everybody's asking, atheists, I do a lot of debates, atheists are asking, how did the light from the stars get here if the earth is only 6,000 years old, which is what the Bible teaches? I said, they're asking the wrong question. If he stretched out the heavens, see, the Bible says he made the earth first, then he made the stars, then he stretched them out into heaven. 17 times it says that. He stretched out the heavens. He stretcheth forth the heavens. So at the first, God made the earth on day one. On day four, he made the stars <clears throat> and stretched them out into place. So instead of asking, how did the light get from the star to here, we should be asking, how did the star get from here to there? Adam and Eve would see the taillights of the stars as they're receding in all directions because he stretched out the heavens. So the scoffers are ignorant of this creation. Okay, so this original creation, let me get different, uh, right here, Psalm, I mean, uh, verse, verse number, slide number 226, Alt-DV, 226, here we go. Earth's atmosphere today, has six layers to it, the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer, a layer of water or probably ice above the atmosphere. If you go up through our atmosphere right now, you have very distinct layers. There's a couple of spots where it gets really cold. I mean, like if you've ever flown in an airplane oh, over the Atlantic or over the Pacific, I've done both, you find that when they get up to a certain altitude, it's like 100 below zero outside. I mean, in the middle of summertime, going to Hawaii, it's 100 below zero, just six, file, six miles up. Uh, <clears throat> I believe the Bible teaches, and the evidence shows, there used to be a crystalline canopy of super cold ice about 10 miles above the earth. Today, the air we're breathing is about 50 miles thick, and we're at the bottom of the ocean of air, okay? And it's pushing down on us 14.7 pounds per square inch. Well, if you <clears throat> squeezed all the air down from 50 miles down into 10 miles, now everybody would have compressed air, a lot more air pressure, and breathing would be easier. Every time you take a breath, you get twice as many or three times as many oxygen molecules in there, and you could run for hundreds of miles without getting tired. I think also this would make it possible for much bigger animals to fly because the ability to fly, you know, you got to flap through the air. If the air is thinner, you can't fly. Most birds have a limit how high they can fly. Our airplanes have a limit how high they can fly. So <clears throat> because of the, the uh, air getting thinner, if you ever climb a tall mountain, I climbed Mount Rainier one time, boy, hard to breathe up there. And Google, Google how, how tall is Mount Rainier? I forgot. But I know if you climb Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, you get up around five miles, it's hard to breathe. But the air keeps going to, uh, for 50 or 60 miles. So I believe there was a canopy of water above the atmosphere. This crystalline canopy, I, the Jews have always said it was two or three fingers thick. How they knew that, 
I don't know, maybe God told Adam and he passed it on or something. But a couple inch layer of ice, super cold ice above the air, compressing the air down. This, this ice would help block some UV light. So they would live much longer. The summit is 14,411. 14,400 feet. Okay, so a little less than three miles. And it's hard to breathe up there. Three miles. All right. This canopy of ice above would block UV light, block x-rays. They would live much longer. It might have been held up or suspended by Earth's magnetic field or just like an inflatable building, just simple air pressure. <clears throat> See, ice weighs about five pounds per square foot if it's an inch thick. So if it was a couple inch layer of ice spread out around the whole world, held up by the air, air pressure or by the Earth's magnetic field, super cold ice is magnetic. They've done Here's a Japanese train floating off the tracks with magnetism to go super fast because there's less friction. So I don't think anybody argues. The physicists agree that super cold ice is magnetic. A magnetic skateboard uh, hovers because it's repelling. Let's see. Called the concentrator effect. <clears throat> you can read all about it another time. But so if the canopy, I believe the Earth t it had a canopy of ice above the atmosphere, a complete shell surrounding the Earth. And ice, <clears throat> there's articles about it certainly is magnetic at low temperature. <clears throat> Apologize for my throat, brother. I talk a lot around here. If you get the book of Josephus, Josephus written about the time of Christ. He was a historian. He said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was hidden in thick darkness, and God commanded there to be light. And he named the darkness, let's see, the light from the darkness he named night. Uh, he says, he set the heaven above the universe, surrounding it with ice. Huh. Another translation of Josephus. <clears throat> then he placed a crystalline <clears throat> he placed a crystalline firmament around it. God made the firmament, the thickness was between three being three fingers. Hmm. Here's another uh, that's from uh, let's see some rabbi literature. This guy said the thickness was two fingers. And the Jews fight over everything. I'm sure they. some people said it was, you know, they started the Church of the Two Fingers and the Church of the Three Fingers. I don't care. But <clears throat> it says it was a flattened, solid surface. On the second day, God brought forth the four creations, the firmament. It's a crystal stretched forth over the heads of the Hayat. There was a crystal. He made it crystallize into the solid. Let's say the firmament is not more than three fingers thick, whatever it was. A couple inch thick layer of ice completely surrounding the world would be like a big greenhouse or an Eskimo's igloo. You know, Eskimos can build a house out of snow. And it's an insulator, believe it or not. Inside can be 61 degrees. Outside, minus seven. Just the ice keeps the temperature in. So again, you got different temperatures at different altitudes. I think everybody agrees with that. Our current 60 miles of air were squeezed down to 10 miles. The pressure at sea level would increase by 50 to 100 percent, so breathing would be easier. Absolute zero is minus 459. Uh, let's see. So, if the temperature in outer space is about almost absolute zero, this would keep the canopy frozen. This crystalline canopy would be have air inside, nice and warm, and real cold outside, just like an Eskimo's igloo does. Uh, does es igloo doesn't melt. From the, from the heat inside. All right, let's see. So there was not only a canopy of ice overhead, there was water under the crust of the earth. Most of what's now in our oceans used to be inside the earth. Today, the earth is 70% underwater. The Bible says God formed it to be inhabited. Well, a whole bunch of it is not habitable. So what happened? The flood and the scoffers are ignorant of that flood. This water under the crust is mentioned several times in the Bible. <clears throat> the earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. What's this saying? He made the earth on top of the water. Psalm 33, he, he layeth up the depth in storehouses. The depth or the deep is always a reference to the oceans in the Bible. The deep, the oceans used to be stored inside the earth. It says he stretched out the earth above the waters. There used to be <clears throat> not only a canopy of ice overhead, a couple inches thick, then 10 miles of air. Then there was a crust to stand on. Adam and Eve walked around on the ground. Probably, let's pick a number and say it was 10 miles thick. Just guessing. Under that was a whole bunch of water. There was water under the crust of the earth. 
That is where most of the flood water came from. It says all the fountains of the deep broke open. Water under the crust, the earth cracked up like an eggshell and went shooting out. The water went shooting out. And by the way, the earth is still cracked up like an eggshell. We have fault lines all over the place. Then that's where most of the earthquakes are. This water would go shooting out really fast because a cubic foot of rock weighs about 160 pounds, depending on what kind of rock. I understand the density issue. Okay. 10 miles of rock would be pushing down eight and a half million pounds of pressure per square foot. Once it gets a crack where the water can squirt out, it's going to shoot out like a, like a jet, faster than a jet. It's actually going to shoot up so fast it could launch the rocks along the edge as it rips rocks off, launch them into space. I think some of the rocks would go shooting up and leave our orbit. Then I, maybe some of the meteors that were still hitting as we go around the you know, meteor showers, car from stuff that launched off during the flood. Some would go up and not go fast enough and would come back down. <clears throat> the escape velocity, how fast you have to go, diminishes with the uh, square of the distance and all that. But there we go, escape velocity for planets. How, far, how fast do you have to go? Well, to get off of the Earth, you've got to go 25,000 miles an hour. If you want to get off the moon, it's a different number because it's a lot less gravity, only 5,000 miles an hour. So all this debris launched into space could have come from the time, from the flood, when the fountains of the deep broke open. It's interesting. Some of it would blast up and hit the moon. Some would hit the moon directly. And some went past the moon, came back. Moon's gravity is kind of weak, sucked it back in. And maybe that's why the craters on the far side are so small. Very different. Why does the moon look so different on the other side? I think maybe the craters were all made by stuff coming from Earth, shooting up there. So if they take a real expensive ride to the moon and come back with moon rocks and analyze them, they're probably going to find some of them are similar to the Earth because they came from Earth. Right? And some of them came back down. Some of the rock came back down and landed on the Earth and made big craters. There are craters all over the Earth, too, by the way. Behringer Crater in Arizona. So this water escaping from under the crust as the cracks develop, that would push the uh, widen the crack by just simple erosion or abrasion. And <clears throat> when the crack gets wide enough, it's going to make the basalt underneath spring up, causing the continents to slide away, uh, as long as there's still water underneath lubricating coming out. And that might explain why we have wrinkled mountains. If you push a piece of carpeting into the wall, it, it wrinkles up like that. I think maybe the wrinkled mountains are from lateral compression that happened during the beginning of the flood. Okay, so the earth is cracked up. Nobody argues about that. There are fault lines all over the place, and they study them, and that's where the earthquakes are. Also, they're finding there is still water trapped under the crust of the earth. When they got down to the bottom of the ocean, they found probably tens of millions of hot water vents, water shooting up into the bottom of the ocean. Well, now, hold on. If there's water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean, uh, where does it have to be coming from? D down lower than that. There's still stuff on, under the crust of the ocean, or you couldn't have these hot water vents squirting up into the bottom of the ocean. If they're on land, they're a geyser, like Yellowstone, uh, the old faithful geyser. If they're underwater, they're called therm hot water thermal vents. The hunt for Earth's deep hidden oceans, Quantum Magazine did an article, and said there are 10 oceans full of water in the crust of the Earth still today. Their guesstimate is there are huge quantities of water still trapped in the crust of the Earth. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. There was a wa there was water in the crust of the earth. Okay, a new scientist magazine, Jules Verne's idea of a deep ocean deep below the surface may not have been too far off. Earth's mantle may contain many oceans worth of water, ten a thousand kilometers down. Wow! If it wasn't there, we would all be submerged. If all that water was on the surface, we'd all drown. This implies a bigger reservoir of water on the planet than previously thought. So go a third of the way to the Earth's core. Well, there are deep hydrothermal vents. We can get into that some other time. Nobody argues about that. There's hot water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean. Just Google hydrothermal vents. So as this water escaped to the top, the crust of the Earth, which is rock, is heavier than water. As the water is leaving, the crust is sinking in to take up the space where it's squirting out of. And what would happen, that would concentrate the mass of the Earth in a smaller uh, diameter. And it's like an ice skater, when they pull their arms in, when they're spinning, they spin faster. Concentrating the mass makes it spin faster. So that's why most ancient calendars have a 360-day year. 
And today the Earth is 365.2422. Ah, the Earth sped up as a result of the contracting the mass, and then now it's been slowing down ever since then, okay? So here we go. All ancient, 8th century BC, civilizations all over the world discarded or modified their 360-day calendars. 800 years before Christ, they had to modify the calendar. What happened here? Ah, Romans used a 360-day calendar with varying lengths of months. Egyptians had a 360-day calendar. I think Noah's flood even explains that. Anyway, so this canopy of ice overhead <clears throat> would make the earth like a big greenhouse or hothouse. It would block some of the solar radiation, keep the heat, block out the UV light, which makes you wrinkle up, and block out the uh, ultraviolet light. European scientists using ultra-cold orbiting telescopes have discovered unimaginable volumes of water in the space between the stars. Scientists were astounded to find water vapor in the freezing atmospheres of Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Titan. Wow. 25 years ago, they find water out there in space. Hmm. In the book of Job, we read God answering Job's questions. He said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He said, when the morning stars sang together. Now, hold on. Is God telling Job that the stars are singing? I think so. See, if you had a crystalline canopy overhead, that could act as your radio. To God, Job, you could hear the music of the stars. That'd be cool, like living inside of a giant stereo with beautiful music playing all the time. Uh, when the morning stars sang together, this crystalline canopy, it said, God covered himself with light as with a garment. And then it said he stretched out the heavens again. And it says in Psalm 104, he laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed. Verse 6, thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. So God covered the earth with water. Here it is. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke, they fled. What's the they referring to? Uh, the water. I believe at the end of the flood, the mountains lifted up, the oceans sank down, the crust of the earth is broken up into pieces. So a piece as big as Texas is going to tilt a half a mile, and the water is going to come around, come down. It's interesting, <clears throat> all the mountain ranges in the world, all the major mountain ranges, follow the coastline. Uh, Appalachian Mountains follow the North Atlantic. The Andes Mountains follow the South Pacific. I believe the oceans and the mountain ranges have formed at the same time because of the same thing, because the fountains of the deep broke open, the crust was broken, and they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. So the earth broke up, all the mountain ranges seem to follow coastlines. Hmm. Well, then it says in chapter 8, verse 1, the waters assuaged. That means they sank down. It doesn't mean they dried up and went away, they actually sank down. The, the floor of the ocean just settled down in, and the water would rush to fill in that hole. It says, at the, at the water's return from off the earth continually. This is an interesting Hebrew phrase, returned from off the earth. It's a phrase, halak vashab. <clears throat> it means the water was going and returning, going and returning. Well, if, we had built, if you had your house three feet deep in water, and one section sank down, the water would rush into the hole, but it would slosh back and forth for a while till the energy is dissipated. So you got the layers of the earth laid down, the horizontal layers. Then the layers are folded up with the, at, near the end of the flood, and all the layers of rock are bent, and there's no cracks in them, no fracture marks. They were all soft and bent at the same time. The layers of the earth are not different ages. There's no such thing as a geologic column. That is so stupid. The atheists say, well, the top layer is younger. I love to ask them, guys, if the top layer is younger, I got a simple question. Where did it come from? Did it come from outer space? There's no such thing as a geologic column. That's the Bible for the atheist, though. There is no Jurassic period or Cenozoic or Mesozoic or all that stuff. It's all baloney. So the water would rush back and forth from just the crust of the earth being tilted and the water settling into the hole. That's going to erode the surface off and make new layers on top. I think the only way to explain what's called an unconformity is Noah's flood. Grand Canyon has some big ones. You got layers tilted up and then cut off and then more layers on top. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month, but Noah didn't get out. Back in chapter 7, <clears throat> In the 600th year of Noah's life, 
the second month, the 17th day of the month, is when the flood started. And in verse 14, the second month, the seventh, 20, 20th day of the, of the earth was dried up. Noah was in the ark for over a year. If you look at all the dates that are found in the Bible, he went into the ark, the rain started, hit the bottom, and he was in the ark. He stayed in for uh, seven months. Why didn't he get out after seven months? Well, was it still muddy? And there was nothing to eat. He waited five more months and then went out of the ark. Let's see, listening to the stars, crystal radio, you can do that. Maybe they had that over the whole earth, live inside of a stereo. Okay, let me get up to um, the fl fl flood, I think. The scoffers are ignorant of this, what the world was like, and that causes them to make some really crazy uh, decisions about other things, like 347 here. A huge trove of dinosaur fossils found in Antarctica. Wait, wait, wait. Dinosaur reptile bones in Antarctica? There are <clears throat> no reptiles in Antarctica. It's, it's chilly down there. How do you find a huge trove of dinosaur bones in Antarctica? Huh. Well, the whole world used to be habitable. Today, the Earth is 70% underwater, 10% under ice caps, 10% under deserts. The whole Earth, if the Earth were not tilted, right now it's tilted over 23 and a half degrees. If it were straight up and down while it spins and goes around the Earth, everybody would get 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness. Equinox, North Pole, South Pole. I think it was designed to be inhabited. It was perfect temperature everywhere. Springtime, all the time, everywhere. And the whole world was covered with plants and animals. Most of the water was in the crust. Now it's on the surface, and most of the Earth is still underwater. Okay? New theory. <clears throat> a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. Why would they say that? Well, because oxygen deprivation caused dinosaur extinction. Huh. This has been taught for a long time. They know this. New theory. Lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. Here's the article. It says an 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How's an 80-foot animal going to get enough air? Well, he couldn't. But we find the bones, the dinosaurs did live. Giant Spinosaurus, 50 feet long. Wow. 33-foot dinosaur found in the Sahara Desert. Well, now hold it. How Today, obviously, they couldn't live out there. Something was different. Even in the Sahara Desert, tropical habitats are proven by fossil fuels. They drill down in the desert and get oil. Ancient Sahara graveyard fossils, hundreds of human skeletons, show life in Africa's desert was once green and lush. Uh, I would agree with that. The Alaska pipeline <clears throat> has moved more than 18 billion barrels of oil, fossil fuel, from smushed up dead things. Even at the North and South Pole, past the tropical zones, there's proven fossil fuels. The whole world used to be habitable. Lots more about giants and all that stuff in our, in our science center here if you come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. Uh, here we have up in Canada, uh, super lungs gave dinosaurs the energy to run and fight. Super lungs. Hmm. In the oxygen-poor air of the Mesozoic era, nothing should have been able to move fast. But velociraptors could run 64 kilometers per hour. Secret weapon, super efficient bird-like lungs. Well, maybe so, <clears throat> but I think they had greater air pressure and more oxygen molecules per square inch. When they cut into amber, maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park. <clears throat> they dig it, drill in there and hit mosquitoes and take the blood out of the mosquito and reconstruct the dinosaur. Mosquito blood. Well, that's far-fetched. But in amber, they quite often find air bubbles. There's an air bubble trapped in amber. Hoven theory. When the flood took place, the trees would break all over the world from the rushing back and forth of the water. And the sap oozes out, which is what amber is made from, tree sap. When they look at amber bubbles, they find they've got 32% oxygen. Hmm. The air you and I are breathing right now is 21% oxygen. So they had 50% more oxygen than we do. They found that as air was 32%. The only trend in literature is that far more oxygen in the early Earth. Wow. This has been known for a long time. Let's see. Profound evolutionary implication scene, air at the time of the dinosaurs was richer in oxygen. I would agree. 80 million years ago, I would disagree with that. They found it was 50% richer in oxygen. 
air bubbles show they had 35% oxygen. Well, under double atmospheric pressure, not only your red blood cells would carry, ox would carry oxygen, the plasma would become an oxygen carrier. What's the role of hyperbaric oxygen therapy? We have a hyperbaric chamber here at Dinosaur Adventure Land if you want to come try it. Let's see. In 100 milliliters of blood, there's 15 grams of hemoglobin. So the blood has a capacity to hold 21 milliliters of oxygen. But what if you pressurize it? Well, baby Jessica fell down in the well in Texas about, what, 35 years ago. And her left leg slipped down in a pipe. Her right leg came up behind her. She's doing the splits as she slid all the way down. And she was down there for two and a half days, 58 and a half hours. Her leg was without circulation. So they said, let's try putting her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Because some of the doctors said, we got to cut her leg off. You know, been no circulation for two days. They put her in a hyperbaric chamber, high pressure oxygen, and her leg was saved and her foot. They had to amputate half of her little toe instead of the whole leg. Okay. Here she is at the White House. So our chamber, this is a steel one. I've been in those. They're pretty cool. High pressure oxygen. Ours is an inflatable one. In West Germany, for years, if you have a stroke, they put you in hyperbaric oxygen pay, uh, chamber. In England, they got six, they had 6,000 chambers for multiple, or 6,000 multiple sclerosis patients treated with this. So I think <clears throat> the whole earth was like a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Patients who got extra oxygen were half as likely to be nauseated after surgery. Autism and neurological disorder can be treated with hyperbarics. Hyperbaric therapy, this is 20 years ago. So 200 times more oxygen into the blood plasma. There's a one person chamber. A lot of professional teams have a hyperbaric chamber. The healing time is twice as fast. So open theory, I believe the original creation was inside a canopy of ice, increased air pressure, water under the crust of the earth, and <clears throat> totally habitable from North Pole to South Pole. That's why they find trees, redwood stumps up at, near the North Pole. There's no trees up there now, but they find huge stumps of redwood trees up there. Coal miner took for hyperbaric oxygen treatment, the lone survivor of a coal mine collapse, tra taken for oxygen treatment. Huh. Trapped in the mine for 42 hours, 12 others died. His left lung is no longer collapsed. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy can used to be treat brain injuries. Helps get oxygen to other body tissues and they increase the blood flow. So I'll let you read on there's a big one at a hospital. There's a small, we got one like that, similar to that here at Dinosaur Adventureland and also a big one. My son and I went in a hyperbaric chamber one time in Alaska, there's a mall. You get in the chamber and you pay 10 bucks or something and they pump you up to double <clears throat> normal pressure. And they treat all kinds of diseases. Plants would grow bigger. I think that's why they find one guy in Akeo University in Japan started to raise tomato plants with just simply, um, he pressurized CO2 to the stem of the plants. Plants don't want oxygen, they want CO2. But he also filtered out UV light. His tomato plant grew 16 feet tall and had 900 tomatoes. What? Just by filtering the sunlight. Huh. You can read all about it, different articles. They said this one plant might produce 10,000 tomatoes off of one tomato plant. So if the earth was hyperbaric before the flood, as I believe it was, everything would get bigger, including the humans, including the, the lizards. See, lizards never stop growing. Reptiles never stop. If they could live to be 900, like the Bible says, like the people did, well, they'd get 40, 50 feet long. The dinosaurs were li big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. The weatherman today still keeps track of high pressure, low pressure zones. If it's low pressure, it usually means rain. High pressure, it's going to be clear. So under the high pressure canopy, they probably never had any rain at all. The Bible says a mist went forth and watered the face of the ground. So that's enough, brother. I think the scoffer, the Christians or the, the people, are not, they're just not aware of what the original creation used to be like. It was a different world back then. And the scoffers are ignorant of that. Let's see, 92... I think, some, sadly, so many Christians are also. They're ignorant of what the original creation was like. The earth was out of the water and in the water, and the water was earth was overflowed by water and perished. That's what it says. So, anyway, I'm a strong believer in what's called the canopy theory. Some other creationist groups don't believe in that. You tell them I'm right, they're wrong.
Okay. All righty. I have one question uh, personally. Uh, I'm sure. curious as to uh, the hyperbaric chamber. Um, did you notice when after your experience of being in the hyperbaric chamber, did you notice a difference after exiting it? I was in there for one hour and I came out and my friend said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like running around the world. Really? I was just so full of energy. I couldn't believe it. Ah, just yeah, simply that, extra oxygen breathing for an hour. That's interesting. That's interesting. So uh, I'm going to go into Q&A if you don't mind, and I'll just ask some sure. of the questions that some people from our church and then uh, a few other channels, some people had uh, uh, venues, people had reached out. So the first one is what is, and this is kind of a repeated question from a few different people. What is, uh, do you think is the best argument for uh, creation or the best evidence for creation? What's the best evidence that this ink pen was made by somebody? We don't see anything like this happen in nature. It had to have a designer. I don't know who designed it, and I actually don't even care. Okay, but I know it had a designer. I think the best evidence for the creator is the creation itself. If you're walking through the woods and you find a painting hanging on a tree, here's a painting hanging on a tree. What do you immediately conclude? that it, lightning hit the tree and made the painting? Or it grew there for millions of years? No, somebody painted it. If you're walking through the woods and you find an arrowhead, right, you immediately know somebody made this. So I guess it's just intuitive that there has to be a creator. Instead of a part of my tour we give here in the Jeep or the four-wheeler, <clears throat> we stop next to a painting on a tree out in the woods. So, wow, look at this, boys and girls. Lightning hit that tree and made that painting. <laughs> no. I said, do you believe that painting grew there on the tree for millions of years? No. Do you believe a painter painted it? Yeah. But I don't know who did it. There's no name on it, and there's nobody standing here. Do I have to see the painter to believe in him? No. The painting is proof of a painter. The creation is proof of a creator. Now, which creator? You want Allah, Buddha, Jehovah? That's a different argument. But let's get over the first bump first. There's a God. Later, we can argue which one and how long and all that stuff. But there has to be a God. It's a, somebody had to design this pen. Somebody had to design this pencil. Somebody had to design this coffee cup. Things just don't happen by chance like this. Sorry, they just don't. Yeah, yeah, and and oftentimes we do separate them out into these separate arguments. But as you put it, it's kind of a, it's intuitive, and we generally we see this cluster of the complexity of the order of the purpose in our everyday experience. So yeah. Um, the other question that, um, that somebody had was, uh, is there, is there an other, an, an, another area of apologetics where you would find compelling arguments? Do you think that creation, uh, uh, presents the strongest evidence for, for God? Or do you also think that there are arguments from philosophy? Well, the fact that man even wants to know yeah, there's all kinds right. of ways to argue for the existence of God. <clears throat> I ask the atheist, I say, guys, if you believe your brain is nothing but a bunch of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years, how can you trust your own thinking? How do you know you right. don't have some chemicals in there backwards? You know? Right, exactly. Yeah, it's it's uh, like the presuppositional argument. They have to rely on God's creation and and the, their own logic that God gave them. And right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the other question is there is there anything in particular that you changed your mind about over the years of ministry, like in in regards to uh, your studies of creation, where previously maybe you used an evidence in the past, or maybe maybe you didn't use an evidence, but now you adopted that as an evidence for creation, anything significant? Well, I'm always finding more and more things to demonstrate this earth simply cannot be billions of years old. It just cannot be. Now, I, I use the illustration in my, you can go to our Genesis Baptist Church uh, channel on YouTube. I used the illustration uh, last two weeks ago about the age of the earth. We're doing a redoing whole series. I'll do some more tonight on Friday night. I said, if I told you this Bic ink pen was uh, 5,000 years old, could you prove I'm wrong? They'd say, well, yeah, the ballpoint pen wasn't invented until 1888. Okay, well, that just this, that one fact disproves my 5,000-year claim. Then you could say plastics weren't invented until 1907. Oh, well, you just disproved it again. You could say BIC was not even a corporation until after World War II, formed in France in uh, 1945, BIC Corporation. So I don't know when the pen was made. 
but I know it's made after 1945. So I, I'm always seeing new things to, uh, to demonstrate the Earth cannot be billions of years old. Tonight on our channel, Genesis Baptist Church, I'll be talking about the moon, how the moon is clear proof this Earth is not billions of years old. Now, it changed my mind. Uh, I used to teach, and it may still be true, but I don't know, that an ice meteor hit the Earth and caused the ice age and started the flood. Another, I think I've probably modified it some, I think just the crust of the Earth cracking open, shooting rocks up, shattered the canopy, and that got dumped on the poles. The ice age came from this canopy collapsing because super cold ice is magnetic. It would be drawn in and dumped on the North and South Pole. That explains why we have mammoths, elephants, hairy elephants, standing up, frozen, food still in their mouth. They died of suffocation. It snowed so fast and so cold around them, they froze standing up. They find frozen camels like that standing up, bobcat, lynx, jaguars standing up. Uh, <clears throat> I also had to change my theology on end times. I used to believe, because I was taught with the Schofield reference edition, you know, that Jesus comes back before the tribulation. And boy, I wish it was true. But then I read, I did a chart on that. If you want to get my research, I'm not going to fight anybody over it. But I, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' disciples asked him in Matthew 24, Lord, when are you coming back? And what's the sign we should watch for? Matthew 24, Mark 13, same thing. Lord, when are you coming? What's the sign? Luke 21, Lord, when are you coming and what's the sign? I got these three all side by side here. You look down, he, for 20 verses, he explains the great tribulation time. Then at the end of all three passages, he says, I'm coming back after the tribulation when the sun and the moon go dark. You ask me when, you ask me the sign, there they are after the tribulation, when the sun and the moon go dark. So I had to very reluctantly change my theology into post-trib, pre-wrath. We're not here when the wrath of God falls. This is the tribulation time, oh, seven-year tribulation time. Then we're raptured out, and the wrath of God comes in the day of the Lord. The first part of the day of the Lord is about three years of God's wrath, and we're up in heaven at the great feast for that time. Then Jesus comes back. He comes down only to the clouds, calls us up, then he comes back this time to the to the touchdown on the ground for the Battle of Armageddon, and we come with him on white horses. So I got all that. My charge ten bucks. You can get it on drdino.com, our website. So I had to change my theology and lost a lot of friends over that because they were pre-trib like I was for forty years. And yeah, that was going to be my next question. I was going to actually ask two questions in line with that. The first thing was going to be, um, you know, what was your first introduction to post-trib pre-wrath? I read a book by uh, Roland Rasmussen from Canoga Park, California, and someone mailed me the book and said, you got to read that. And the title was Post-Trib Pre-Wrath. I said, I don't believe that. He said, read the book, please. I read it, read it a second time, studied all of his arguments. I said, this guy's right. I preached at his church, at a large church in Canoga Park, California. I said, man, he's right. We're here for the whole tribulation. I don't like that. I think it's already started. I think we're in it. Uh, maybe not. We'll see. But So those are... Probably the major things I've changed my theology on, the uh, the cause of the flood, which is kind of a minor change, versus the, and then the, the timing of the rapture. I was guilty of confusing tribulation with, with wrath. I, when, you, when you tell a Christian you're going to be here for the tribulation, they'll say, wait a minute, the Bible says God's children are not appointed to wrath. Correct. Listen to what you just said. They're not appointed to wrath. See, tribulation is what the world does to us. We're going to be here for that. Wrath is what God does to the world. We're not here for that. Right, right. Okay, and uh, so you did your own personal study. About how long would you say that it took for that transition? A couple of years. I have fought it every way, all That's the good. way. Yeah. I tried, tried yeah. to not believe that. Yeah, and, and like I said, the other the other question you actually got to, and I was going to ask you how well that was received when you converted to post-trib pre-wrath. Well, my book, uh, What on Earth is About to Happen, details in, I mean, in great detail what, what Scripture teaches on the topic. You really got to start with Daniel uh, and, and then Revelation, and there's dozens of other references. So many, many uh, complimented me and, and said, Brother Hoven, you're right. I knew something was wrong with this pre-trib rapture. See, this idea of a pre-trib rapture was made up completely in 1830 by a 15-year-old girl in Scotland. She had dreams. Yeah. She had dreams about, oh, the Lord comes back before the tribulation. 
She told her dreams to some people. The Darby Study Bible published it. The Schofield Bible published it. Several people took her dream and ran with it and created the pre-trib rapture idea. And it's just simply not true. Right, right. Okay. Um, so the uh, the other question that somebody had was, uh, what was your favorite debate that you participated in? Boy, what's a favorite meal? I've eaten a lot of meals in my life. I don't know. If right, right. right. Do yeah, well, hey, may, maybe if we limit it to like formal debates. I don't know if that <laughs> helps any because there's still quite a few of those. I've done 341. Joseph, what's your favorite debate that I've done? Probably Wade the Wizard. Wade the Wizard. I got him coming up next week or something. Yeah, 31st. 31st. Uh, the one I did at Jacksonville there, Embry-Riddle University, uh, aeronautical south of you, uh, I was debating three professors at the same time. And I'll, I'll take on 10 at a time. Uh, the one professor said, where did God come from? Mm -hmm. My two-minute answer to his question has over 900 million views on all the different channels combined. So just type in, where did God come from by Kent Hovind. Two minutes long. That was a that was a good one. Those guys were completely baffled. I didn't yeah. know I knew that. That answer came from God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that clip many times. Not even looking for it. So sometimes I'll yeah, look for it to show it to people, but I'll just be scrolling through. Like you said, it's so viral. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, who would you say is? And this might even be harder. Who would you say was the most uh, formidable opponent? In debating, because obviously debating is not only you know um, intelligence or how prepared you are for a debate, it's you know charisma and things like that. So who would you say? Well, the, the probably one of the more difficult ones uh, was Aaron Nelson, who calls himself Aaron Ra, the Sun God, uh, <clears throat> because he interrupts all the time. He won't shut up. I've told him many times. I, I, I say, I'll debate you anytime if we do it on a neutral platform where the host shuts your microphone off when it's my turn to talk. You shut up when I talk, I'll shut up when you talk. Equal time, one topic at a time. He won't do that either. He throws out 20 things, you only got time to answer two, and then everybody thinks, well, he, he was right on the rest. So he was more difficult only because of his uh, ru rudeness. Not because, yeah, not of, because of skill or anything. Yeah, not because of his intelligence, yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Are there any other creation ministries that you would recommend? There are lots of creation ministries that um, that are part of this big team, you know, that uh, I, I could recommend dozens of them. Uh, some I would disagree with on a few minor things. It's like, are there any are there any people in the world that you agree with 100 percent on everything? Mm. Not that I've met yet. You know, mm. uh, <laughs> you, are there any restaurants you like? Well, I, I don't I hate to have to eat at one all the time. <laughs> you know, I like to switch with. Right. One day Mexican, one day Chinese, one day Arby's. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Ken Ham's ministry in Kentucky is really good. Now, I disagree with him. He doesn't use the King James, and that causes problems, I think. But I think he's done a wonderful work. I wouldn't fight him. I sell his material, recommend people use it. I don't know if he, he probably won't do that with me, but I do that with him. Uh, Institute for Creation Research in, Cal in uh, uh, Dallas, Texas, are good friends of mine, do a great job, icr.org. Creationism.com is a good one. So they all have things they can add, you know. I guess it's like a good a good military. You need an air force, but you also need tanks on the ground and soldiers and and submarines. And we need a lot of people fighting this battle. We need what we need are some congressmen and senators to take this to before, make some legal action where the text they're not allowed to lie to the students in the textbooks. Don't talk about creation. Don't talk about evolution. My video number four of my series creation seminar series is 18 hours, uh, 50 bucks for the whole thing. Video number four is titled Lies in the Textbooks. There are 40 or 50 lies they're still teaching to get the kids to believe in evolution. So I think a congressman or senator needs to introduce legislation that says our textbooks should be accurate. We should not be allowed to lie to the students in public schools at taxpayer expense. If you want to start a public, if you want to start your own school and teach the students, for example, that the baby growing inside the mother has gills like a fish, that was proven wrong in 1874. They're still teaching it today because it's one of the evidences for evolution, embryology, and it's not true. They're still teaching the kids that the uh, whales have a vestigial pelvis; they don't need it anymore. It's proof they used to have legs. That's, that's that's crazy. It's not true. If you we need people on that front, on the legal front, lawyers who have the skill to do so, you know, paralegals, get some legislation together and get your textbooks accurate. 
You don't have to mention creation. You don't have to mention evolution. Just quit lying to the kids and evolution goes away. Right. You kind of alluded to, to at least in line a little bit with uh, the next question. And um, that is, you know, Christians getting along, although we have, you know, slight disagreements here and there on certain topics. Um, what would you say as far as um, Christians disagreeing on the topic of end times? Yeah. Um, I think when we were fighting the Germans in World War II, one of our allies was Russia. I think we disagree with the Russians on all kinds of things, okay? But we needed an ally, and we had a common enemy that was even bigger. So I think Christians uh, differ over lots of different doctrines, okay? There are those who teach baptism is part of salvation, the Church of Christ. Well, I disagree strongly, but I think I could agree with them on many things also. I could probably agree with the Mormons on some things. I can't think of any right now, but if I thought hard <laughs> enough, I might, you know. Okay. So I think Christians are too anxious to fight and split over every little detail, and we should uh, be a little more tolerant uh, on some of the non, I guess, non-essential things. Uh, the charismatics, for instance, you know, they believe that gifts are still for today. And, you know, I, I say, well, why don't you guys raise the dead? That was one of the gifts. Mm, I'll never fine, do that one. Right. They just right. speak in tongues, which anybody, anybody yeah. can fake that one, you know? Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> right. yeah, the one that can be faked, that's that's the right. gift they happen to have. <laughs> yeah. But I don't fight them, okay? We've had visited, they come visit our dinosaur adventure land, they have a blast. and love, love, like, There are those who teach you should keep the Sabbath. You know, okay, we haven't come here all the time. That's fine. I, I just, I don't think, I've never met anybody that keeps it, because you can't go out of your house, you can't start your car, you can't build a fire. You know, there's, read all the Sabbath rules. They don't, nobody, I've never met anybody who keeps the Sabbath. But right. I don't, again, it's not something I'm going to spend my time fighting. we got some Christians now teaching the earth is flat. Kansas is flat. The rest of it's round, okay? Right. But I don't spend my time fighting them. I don't have time for that battle. I'm too busy on creation evolution. Right. Essentially uh, determine the fundamentals. Determine, obviously, uh, the gospel being at the core of that. Right. And uh, there are obviously peripheral things, marginal things that we can we can ignore. Right. Yep. All right. Uh, what's your what's your uh, favorite uh, subset of science as far as your personal interest of, of topics of science? What would it be? I taught biology, earth science and physical science. Uh I love them all. <laughs> Biology. I did a whole series for the last year, every Friday night on my channel, uh, Genesis Baptist Church, called Making Babies. How different animals make babies. And I kept asking the evolutionist, how did this evolve? Could you please give me a step-by-step -step scientific answer for how this evolved? The biology of putting in that study together was fabulous. We're going to have that come out in a DVD series here someday. Another week or so. Another week or so. Okay. Uh, for instance, there's a frog that lays its eggs on its back and then covers them with skin and they hatch out of the frog's back. There's a frog that hatches babies out of its mouth. How, how did that evolve? Wow. <laughs> so that, that was fun, the biology part of that. Physical science, I love that. Uh, the moon is going around the earth. I'll be covering that tonight on my channel uh, at 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the moon's going around the earth, but the moon's getting farther away, inch and a half a year. We're losing the moon. Okay, well, that means it used to be closer. Now, you learn in physics class, the attraction of two masses, like two magnets, if they're pulling toward each other, how strong is that attraction? Well, whatever it is at, if, at this distance, if you bring it into one-third the distance, you take that one-third, flip it over, and square it. It's nine times the pull at one-third the distance. So they've done all the math on this and say, if you keep bringing the moon back in closer, pretty soon they snap together like two magnets, and the magnetic pull is in uh, the gravitational pull is incredible. The moon cannot be the moon and earth cannot be more than 1.2 billion years old. But why are we teaching the kids? It's 4.6 billion. That's just not physically possible with physical science laws. I'll be covering all that tonight. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just a couple more, if you don't mind real quick. So, um, as far as um, uh, since your creation seminar was was released, has there been any other significant scientific discoveries in particular? And I kind of asked this in another form just uh, uh, shortly ago uh, that you've incorporated into that you've added to your presentations that you think was significant in and of itself. Well, I did my seminar hundreds of times all over the world, 37 countries. And then we videotaped it and up freshened it up and redid it many, many, many times. What we have is the 2006 edition 
I think it's still really, really good. Uh, since then, I, I'm, I'm redoing it all. I just started last Friday. I'm doing another session tonight. It's going to take me 20 years. But I'll redo the whole thing with freshened up, uh, updated information. I'm finding more and more stuff to confirm what I said back then is true. Um, like the receding moon one or index fossil kind of stuff or carbon dating, potassium argon dating. I, I have more detail on that. But what I had on here was just, I think, really good. It helps a lot of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm a readaholic. People send me stuff all the time. Oh, you got to read this. You got to watch that. I, I do as best I can. But I want, I want to know the truth. That's all. The truth is very right. simple. God created the heaven and the earth in six days, which means dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve. They didn't live millions of years ago. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, this, I'll be 71 in a couple of days. I, I'm never going to quit uh, learning and studying. This is where God called me to fight. This is my battlefield. All right. What's your favorite uh, uh, topic in the Bible that you, that you enjoy studying? Obviously, you could break it into you know eschatology, like end times or things. What would you say you you most enjoy personally? That varies from time to time. You know, one day my favorite food is Mexican. The next day it's Arby's and Ch Kentucky Fried. Now that's hard to beat. Uh -huh. uh, I love the topic of people say there are contradictions in the Bible, uh -huh. and you can Google it and study it. No, there are not. There are no contradictions. One of the gospel accounts said Judas hung himself. Another account said he fell down and his bowels gushed out. Right. He says, see, there's a contradiction. I say, no, there's a couple of logical answers to that. He hung himself, the rope broke, and he fell down and broke open, gushed out. Right. They both could be true. Or he hung himself and his head came off and he fell down and broke open. Okay. Or he hung himself and the limb broke. Or he hung himself and laid there, hung there for a couple of days and rotted and fell down and broke open. The, both accounts could be true. <clears throat> uh, they talk about Solomon's uh, C, the, about the value of pi, 3.14159 being wrong. And no, it's exactly right in Solomon's C. So I love studying contradictions in the Bible. I love studying end times. Uh, I don't, I can't, I, I don't have an answer, brother. I like them all. Right, right, right. That, that was good. No, that was a good answer. Yeah, well. Um, all right, Brother Hovind, I know you mentioned a couple of times that you have uh, a, uh, a session you're going to be recording tonight. And uh, again, we thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hovind, for being with us. We thank you for the presentation as well. And like I said, we'd love to have you back on uh, at some time, hopefully not too far in the future, where uh, mm -hmm. you could give, uh, I, I believe, uh, Brother Joseph, he mentioned that you have a presentation for End Times as well. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so we would definitely be interested in hearing that and uh, sharing that on the channel. And uh, again, one more time, that's Dr. Ken Hoven, Dinosaur Adventureland, and it's in Lenox, Alabama, correct? Correct. And, uh, I believe the website is drdino.com. Correct. And our YouTube, is it's live every night. You can ask questions every night, 7 o'clock Central Time. We have Afterwards, we have live uh, Q&A time. It's on uh, Genesis Baptist Church, on Odyssey, and Rumble. It's called Kent Hovind Official. Or just go to drdino.com. They're all listed there. Take any questions, I, okay? I think they, they shut down your channel. Is that correct? In the past? Well, it, it was Kent Hovind official on YouTube. They shut it down and never told us why. We came up the very next day on new channel, Genesis Baptist Church. So we've been up the whole time. Right, right. That's great. That's great. Well, all righty. Uh, one more time. I very much so appreciate you coming on, Dr. Hovind. God bless you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. Bye. God bless. Bye.